One in four of our children leave secondary education and can't read properly, can't write properly, and are not competent in arithmetic. And what are they going to do? They can't all be Prime Minister. <laughs> The Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as queen. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. She ascended to the throne and was crowned queen at the tender age of 27. During her entire 70-year reign, Her Majesty worked with over a dozen prime ministers, each of whom formed successive governments on her behalf. I can, now, uh, I can now accept that the country have elected me in my own right to be Prime Minister. Uh, I'm immensely proud of that. I shall try and ensure that I uh, reach the uh, aspirations of people and that I let no one down. That is, I'm delighted to have it. This will give me cabinet authority of a sort. <laughs> As a high school dropout, the teenage John Major could simply never have dreamt that he would one day become a powerful political leader and get elected as Britain's Prime Minister. Major became Her Majesty's ninth Prime Minister, having fought for the leadership of the Conservative Party after Margaret Thatcher's formidable 11-year premiership. It is a very exciting thing to become leader of the Conservative Party and particularly exciting, I think, to follow one of the most remarkable leaders that the Conservative Party has ever had. We may, by the end of this year, have before us a treaty. A treaty that could, amongst other things, allow Europe to develop a single currency at some time in the future. Is it moral to impose obligations on employers, like the social chapter, like the minimum wage, that will cost jobs and prevent those without jobs from having the opportunity of getting them in the future. Again, I think not. Like me or loathe me, don't bind my hands when I am negotiating on behalf of the British nation. After five months of peace, surely it is time to look ahead. Judge our proposals as a whole. There is nothing you need fear. And the fact of the matter is, that what the pessimists say is not true and ought not to go unchallenged. I do not intend to let Britain be sidelined in Europe. Is it moral to compulsorily take too much tax from people for government to spend and in so doing diminish individual choices? My answer is no. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The Queen, beyond doubt, is the best known woman in the world. Probably the most loved woman in the world, I, I would think as well. But what would the Queen make of her new Prime Minister? When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do. Sir John Major, Her Majesty's ninth Prime Minister. The relationship between the British sovereign, the government, and their prime minister is somewhat complex and not always easily understood. As head of state, the monarch must remain entirely neutral with respect to political matters and must be seen to do so, even though he or she may have been quite outspoken prior to their ascent to the throne. The sovereign does not vote nor stand for election. However, they do have vitally important ceremonial and formal roles 
and particular responsibilities in relation to the government of the United Kingdom. The British legislature comprises the Sovereign, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. The monarch's duties are to open each new session of Parliament, announcing to the nation the agenda for their government for that term. The Queen arrived at the House of Lords to open a session of Parliament that all know must end in a general election. She came in the Irish state coach accompanied by the Prince and Princess of Wales, just back from their tour of Canada. The speech she came to deliver is the first written for her by John Major. This time last year, he was still Chancellor of the Exchequer and Mrs Thatcher, the occupant of number 10. Throughout Whitehall, the police and security services were taking no chances. Back in the Lords, the full court was gathered for the Queen. Ambassadors, judges, peers, spiritual and temporal. Black Rod was dispatched to fetch the Commons. It's the last time he'll knock on their door. He's retiring at the next election. With their signature, they also grant royal assent to legislation and approve orders and proclamations through the Privy Council. During her mammoth reign, the Queen also had a very special working and private relationship with her Prime Ministers. Her Majesty retained the right to appoint her Prime Minister and also to meet with him or her on a regular basis. My government attached the highest priority to improving public services. They will implement the program of reform in the white paper on the Citizens Charter, including bringing forward charters for individual public services. Those private weekly meetings have offered great solace and support to her prime ministers, each one honoring the absolute confidentiality of these informal talks but each of whom has also acknowledged the personal support they have received from the Queen in what must often be a lonely position of responsibility. John Major was born on the 29th March, 1943, son of Gwen Major and Tom Major Ball. Living in middle-class Surrey, Major's mother was a part-time teacher and his father made a living selling garden ornaments. Major later described his younger years as comfortable but not well off, facing the same struggles as many families during wartime Britain, and things took a turn for the worse when his father became unwell. The young John Major was admitted into Rutlish School, a grammar school in Merton Park in the southern suburbs of London. Facing financial difficulties, the family had to move home into more modest circumstances, into a small top-floor apartment in Cold Harbor Lane, Brixton, in what was a very impoverished area of London in those days. Perhaps his reduced circumstances in life were a bitter blow to him, but young John Major soon lost interest in his academic studies at school and he left full-time education at the age of 16 with just three O-levels. The teenage John Major decided to pull himself together and to turn his fortunes around. He started applying himself to self-improvement and to hard work, which paid dividends for him in the end. His interest in politics began as he kept up to date with current affairs on his commute to work. His political ambitions were sparked in 1956 from watching Harold Macmillan present his budget to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, having been invited to watch by local MP Marcus Lipton. We've all been thinking a great deal about Suez, but you know the Egyptian crisis isn't the only threat to our future. There's another danger, more familiar, less dramatic. And perhaps it's harder to realize, but in the long run, it's just as serious. And that is the danger that because of our lack of foresight, or if you like, our selfishness, we drive ourselves out of the rank of first-class industrial power. By 1959, Major joined the Young Conservatives in Brixton. He began to give speeches in the soapbox in Brixton Market. In 1964, he stood as a councillor 
in the Lambeth London Borough Council election at the tender age of 21, though he lost to Labour. Major worked in banking before his political days, taking posts with District Bank and Standard Bank. He was even briefly seconded to Just Nigeria as part of his banking role. But politics was still in the mind, and in 1968, Major stood as councillor again in the Lambeth London Borough Council election. The Conservatives received a boost following Enoch Powell's famous anti-immigration Rivers of Blood speech. I have three children. All of them have been through grammar school. Two of them married now with family. I shan't be satisfied till I have seen them all settled overseas. In this country, in 15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Major one despite disagreeing with Powell's views. Major's focus was on housing matters, and he oversaw several large council estates being built. He lost his seat in 1971. In April 1970, Major met Norma Johnson at a Conservative Party event in Brixton. They married in October that year, moving to a flat in Streatham and welcoming their first child, Elizabeth, in November 1971. Major's personal family life was going well, but his political one faced multiple setbacks. Though he managed to get on the Conservative Central Office's list of potential MPs, he lost in the February and October elections of 1974 in the Labour-dominated St. Pancras North constituency. He went on to try for more promising seats but continued to be unsuccessful until 1976, when he secured a conservative seat in Huntingdonshire. He went on to win Huntingdon in the 1979 general election, which brought Margaret Thatcher to power. Plainclothes police out of a car behind her, and Mrs. Thatcher out onto the, onto the doorstep. Thank you very much. How do you feel at this moment? Very excited, very aware of the responsibilities. Her Majesty, the Queen, has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. It is, of course, the greatest honor that can come to any citizen in a democracy. He was well-liked, had a relaxed, genuine, and sincere charm. In 1987, Major was promoted to the cabinet as chief secretary to the treasury. Thatcher promoted Major quickly within the party. It was clear she liked him. She went on to give him the title of foreign secretary in July 1989. He went from being the most junior member of the cabinet to playing a significant role. Under Thatcher's premiership, Major learned a great deal about being a leader and the inner workings of the cabinet. The round of UN diplomacy took him to a first meeting with his Argentine opposite number this evening and talks about resuming relations disrupted by the Falklands War. Tomorrow, Mr. Major will turn his attention to Hong Kong, discussing the colony's future in a private meeting here with the Chinese foreign minister. But the foreign secretary's making it clear he intends to continue efforts to rally support for the drug war in Colombia. We must all do more, he said. Despite Thatcher's successes, there was a growing unease among some of her colleagues. Issues of unemployment and inflation were still in people's minds, along with poll tax riots and fears of future strife caused Thatcher to begin to lose her popularity. One of the many bones of contention was Thatcher's stance on Europe and the European exchange rate mechanism. Thatcher was adamant that Britain should not be ruled from Brussels, and she was concerned at the gradual erosion of British sovereignty and the country's ability to be allowed to manage itself. The creeping federalism of Europe would be one of the main themes of some of her most powerful speeches in Parliament, sowing seeds of doubt on the unification of Europe. The beautifully oiled machine was starting to fail and a plot was being hatched to unseat Thatcher from her position of power. 
For eight years, Margaret had this remarkable capacity to judge public opinion and get it right. And after eight years, inevitably, surrounding by the trappings of Prime Minister, inevitably you lose that acute ear for public opinion. Not a criticism of her, I think it was true of at least one successor of hers and of others earlier in history. And I think she was wrong about poll tax. Jeffrey Howe, her longest serving cabinet minister, chose to plunge the dagger and he offered an ultimatum. He threatened to resign unless Thatcher agreed to join the European exchange rate mechanism, which she refused. No, the people of Britain do not want petty bureaucracy. They do not want taxation rates imposed upon us without the consent and agreement of the British Parliament. Ultimately, he did resign, and his resignation speech left the House of Commons questioning their Prime Minister's ability to continue to lead her party and the country. In his infamous resignation speech, he said, the time has come for others to consider their own response to the tragic conflict of loyalties with which I have myself wrestled for perhaps too long. After just three months in his role as foreign secretary, Major became chancellor of the Exchequer. Major insisted on joining the ERM against Thatcher's wishes. Thatcher's popularity was declining, whilst Major's was excelling. Eventually, in 1990, Thatcher succumbed to mounting pressures and announced they would join the ERM. Things came to a head in 1990, when Michael Heseltine challenged Thatcher for leadership of the Conservative Party, in part due to differences of opinion on the European Union. Thatcher won the first vote, but the majority was too small to be an outright victory. One by one, she was advised by her cabinet members to resign. I said to each of them individually beforehand, I said, if you don't speak the truth to her when you go and see her, I shall be extremely angry. You have to tell her what you've told me, because she must know where she stands. And they did. I went in first. I said she'd been defeated and should step down, and she wouldn't win the second ballot against Michael Heseltine, but she should allow Douglas Heard and John Major to come in. Uh, she said I was being defeatist and tried to rally me, you know, get me to pull myself together and stop being so, you know, so defeatist. And we, we failed to agree. Realizing her time was up, but not wanting to fall victim to Heseltine's plot, Thatcher decided to resign. On November 22, 1990, she resigned as leader of the Conservative Party and as Prime Minister after 11 consecutive years in office. Number 10 is a house and a home, as well as an office, and as Margaret Thatcher left it after so long, there was applause to be heard, and I'm told a tear or two shed among the unseen staff. Mrs. Thatcher's own voice had an emotional edge to it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years, and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. But then the Iron Lady's composure almost broke. Watch her face as she reaches her car. She recovered quickly for one last wave. Friends say, though, that she is deeply shocked by the seeming injustice of it all. Three election victories and a clear, though insufficient, majority in the first ballot, rewarded, as she sees it, with the sack. In her final bid to hold her head up high and to outwit her arch enemy, Michael Heseltine, she moved her chess pieces to make certain that John Major would become her successor. Famously, Thatcher always maintained she was undefeated she never lost an election, and she resigned herself. One can only imagine the conversation at the final meeting when Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister for 11 and a half years, went to Buckingham Palace to offer her resignation to the Queen. Major won the vote for leadership with 185 votes, 
Though Douglas and Heseltine could have challenged it, they conceded. Michael Heseltine, 1-3-1. Douglas Heard, 56. John Major, 1-8-5. Huntingdon Conservative Club members knew they were on a winning streak. Their domino team has won its last three matches. But there was just a slight hint of doubt about what the figures meant until the Heseltine concession. And that was received in the appropriate manner. Huntingdon tonight is no longer the constituency, it's the Prime Minister's seat. I think he's a fantastic guy. I mean, he'll make a first class Prime Minister. Grey image? There's no grey image. What you see is what you get. Fantastic guy. I've known him now for 20 years. I've always seen that steely determination in him. Um, he'll do a fantastic job as Prime Minister. He'll, first of all, heal the party and he'll take the party to victory at the next general election. What sort of changes can we expect? You'll have to ask John that. I don't think you'll see many changes. Um, he thoroughly approves of what the government has done today. You may as well see some changes in style and presentation. But I think you'll find he'll be, he'll be pursuing the policies of the present government. Huntingdon produced Oliver Cromwell. Now it's produced a prime minister. Tonight, something to be celebrated. On the 28th November 1990, John Major accepted Her Majesty's invitation to form a government. It is said, as he drove out of the golden gates of Buckingham Palace, he thought about how far he'd come from a boy growing up in a cramped flat in Brixton to Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, living in number 10 Downing Street. I'd like, uh, I'd like, firstly, if I may, to thank my many parliamentary colleagues for the tremendous support they've given me today. It's an enormous encouragement to know that so many people in the parliamentary party are prepared to entrust me with the leadership of the Conservative Party, and I will endeavour to discharge those responsibilities to the best of my ability. If I may, I do think this particular election has enhanced the democratic process quite substantially. It's been a very clean election, an election based on substance and not personality, and an election that has dealt very constructively with the issues. And I'd like to offer my very uh, grateful thanks to Douglas Hurd and to Michael Heseltine, both for the way they conducted the election and also for the very gracious way in which they have conceded that they will not stand on the third ballot. It is, it is, it is, it is a very exciting thing to become leader of the Conservative Party and particularly exciting, I think, to follow one of the most remarkable leaders that the Conservative Party has ever had. I believe as time proceeds and Margaret Thatcher's uh, period as Prime Minister is seen in a proper perspective, that it will be seen that she has been a very great Prime Minister indeed. Our job now, I think, is quite clear. We're going to unite. We're going to unite totally and absolutely, and we're going to win the next general election. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all very much. My first task immediately. How do you feel, Mrs. My first, my first task immediately is to go and thank the enormous number of my parliamentary colleagues, friends, and others who've been working in this campaign. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Unfortunately for John Major, he inherited a government dominated by the 1990s recession, caused by high interest rates and falling house prices. Unemployment rate, by the end of 1991, was 2.5 million. Nonetheless, opinion polling for the Conservative government remained fairly stable. A fresh face on the Conservative Party welcomed an opportunity for change, and Major felt a great responsibility and sense of duty to help an ailing country and economy to heal. The deeply unpopular poll tax was an area which Major knew must be dealt with quickly, a task he appointed to Heseltine. I certainly do not rule out the need for further changes in the community charge. And as I talk to my colleagues, and these discussions are not concluded and will continue with my colleagues, I do become uh, increasingly convinced that we will not be able to leave things as they are. In no sense, where necessary, where necessary, and if necessary, would I be afraid to make changes in government policy.
In April 1993, hold tax was replaced with council tax, a sliding scale based on property prices. The international landscape was also changing rapidly. The early 90s marked the collapse of the Soviet Union, as well as the end of the apartheid in South Africa. Major remained engaged in the international organizations such as the United Nations and the Commonwealth, of which the Queen was head. For the first time in recent political memory, Commonwealth leaders gathered for a meeting where strong feelings about South Africa no longer threaten the harmony. The British camp has been working hard to ensure that what differences still exist don't develop into open disputes. And the Prime Minister's efforts were rewarded today. Over lunch, Nelson Mandela briefed him on his ideas for changing the timetable for lifting sanctions against South Africa. The ANC leader followed that with the sort of endorsement politicians dream of. Whatever differences may be there, one thing is clear, that uh, the British government and the British people are the enemies of all forms of racial uh, discrimination. There is an awkward question being quietly asked here. Once the Commonwealth stops arguing about South Africa, does it become little more than a rather grand international club? That's why there's so much talk this week about finding a new role for the Commonwealth. Among those dining with the Queen tonight, there's no question of abandoning Commonwealth traditions like decision by consensus. So initiatives like John Major's proposal that the Commonwealth become a guardian of human rights and democracy have to be made rather gingerly, especially when they involve pointing the finger of blame. Member states of the Commonwealth have not always applied the values which our organization represents, but we have always held on to those values. They represent a yardstick of behavior for each one of us. The Commonwealth is well placed to catch the tidal wave of human rights and democracy which is sweeping across much of the world. Though actively engaged, Major found some of these meetings to be deeply frustrating. Nothing much would be achieved, and he would tire of sitting through interminable speeches and watching elaborate ceremonies. Major felt, in particular, the G7 summits were notorious for this. After agreement from U.S. President Bill Clinton, successive summits were much more scaled down and informal, much to Major's delight. We've told Saddam Hussein, he's been told quite clearly by the Allies, that we wish to ensure the safety of the no-fly zone. Firstly, he must honour the no-fly zone, there must be no more flying in it. And secondly, he must remove the SAM missiles. That's made perfectly clear to him. He knows that. He's set a time frame for it. I hope he will comply. One of the defining elements of John Major's premiership was the Gulf War. John Major became prime minister shortly after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. U.S. President George Bush and John Major worked together to try and find a peaceful solution. The so-called special relationship between the U.K. and U.S. continued in Major's premiership. Major and Bush got on remarkably well. However, despite their best efforts, Military action started in January 1991, after Iraq had been given a deadline to leave, but their forces continued to occupy Kuwait. John Major has brought a fighting message to Saudi Arabia, rejecting out of hand any deal short of total withdrawal by Saddam Hussein telling his hosts that Iraq could not possibly win any war and dismissing any talk of changing the deadline for withdrawal. The airport at which he landed is ready for war. The signs of the American buildup are everywhere. And because of that massive force, John Major says the Allies cannot lose. I hope Saddam Hussein realizes what's ranged against him. There is no possibility that he could win any conflict, no possibility whatsoever. And that is mostly because the air power would be overwhelmingly on one side? The air power is very substantial, but the rest of the power is awesome as well. 
News of the attempt by Iraq to get the deadline for action postponed filtered through as he toured. The Prime Minister was not interested. No, there's no question of shifting the deadline. We've known for some time that he may play games of this sort and try to edge the deadline forward. It isn't something that we're prepared to contemplate. That tough line is partly the result of the suffering of those still in Kuwait, outlined once again in a meeting with the exiled Kuwaiti leaders earlier today. It's also, of course, part of the campaign to persuade Saddam that withdrawal is his only option. The British here still hope the Iraqi leader will change his mind and withdraw, but like the rest of the country, they're preparing for war. Diplomats were handing out some of 12,000 gas masks to British civilians today as John Major arrived. Well, it's very nice to see you all. How does he explain to those who might be caught up in a Gulf War why the price is worth paying? If we are not prepared to deal with this matter now, we might face, quite apart from not correcting a wrong that needs to be put right, we might face a far greater problem in the not too distant future. I don't think that's tolerable. We've learned from history in the past that if you put off dealing with this sort of problem, you may well have a larger problem a little later. Everyone, I think, in the international community understands that very well. Tonight came an audience with King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, the subject security in the Gulf after Kuwait is regained. Tomorrow, John Major travels into the desert for perhaps the most vital part of this tour to see some of the 34,000 British servicemen and women on duty in the Gulf. He'll ask them what their problems are and he'll try to reassure them that if the war comes, it's one they're going to win. Now, tomorrow you visit the British troops and you've um, said that uh, Saddam Hussein cannot win any conflict because of the sheer force um, uh, against him. He can, nevertheless, embark on a nasty and um, brutal conflict involving many British personnel. Well, he's already embarked upon a nasty and brutal conflict in Kuwait. We know he has done that, and it is to expel him uh, from continuing that. The British troops are there. They are well aware of that. There is the most enormous amount of Allied power here, both air power and land power. It is quite impossible for Saddam Hussein to prevail against that, and I hope he will realize it. If we are not prepared to deal with this matter now, we might face, quite apart from not correcting a wrong that needs to be put right, we might face a far greater problem in the not too distant future. I don't think that's tolerable. We've learned from history in the past that if you put off dealing with this sort of problem, you may well have a larger problem a little later. Everyone, I think, in the international community understands that very well. Major flew to the Gulf to see for himself what the situation was. Meeting the servicemen struck a chord with Major. His son was only a little younger than the troops, and it was very moving for him to see the reality of what was happening. The Prime Minister charged across the sands of Saudi Arabia today in the company of the troops who next week may be committed to war. In Mr. Major's words to the troops, Close in, please. We may invite you to forcibly remove Saddam Hussein. But for all the warlike talk in the desert, Mr. Major has effectively ruled out the use of the ultimate weapon. The question, if the Allies are attacked with chemical weapons, would they retaliate with nuclear? We have plenty of weapons uh, short of that, and we have no plans of the sort you envisage. And we hope, and we hope, uh, we hope it is perfectly clear to Saddam Hussein that uh, firstly that our men will be well protected against chemical weapons. He'd be very unwise to do that. I hope, I hope he won't do that. I hope he will actually have the sense to make a peaceful withdrawal, but we have plenty of weapons short of those you mentioned. Otherwise, Mr. Major took an extremely tough line against Saddam, promising there'd be no concessions to gain peace. He would be forced to leave all the land he had taken. It was a visit designed to raise morale among the armed forces and at home as well, as the deadline for action draws near. Major made an unusual prime ministerial broadcast upon his return to the UK. First, we must get Iraq out of Kuwait, right out of Kuwait. Second, we must restore Kuwait's legitimate government. And third, we must uphold the authority of the United Nations. The operation on which we have embarked involves danger and sacrifice. But I am confident that it will succeed, and we know it is a battle which has to be fought. Now, the 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution, have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail.
air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. On the 16th January 1991, Operation Desert Storm commenced. U.S. warplanes attacked military targets in Iraq. On the 24th February, ground war began. Of course, the Queen, among her many other roles, is head of armed forces. Conversations between the Queen and her Prime Minister would have surely included great discussion about sending her troops to war. Most unusually, the Queen televised a broadcast detailing the nation's pride in its armed forces and her hope for a swift conclusion to the Gulf War. As they, with our allies, face a fresh and yet sterner challenge, I hope that we can unite in praying that their success will be as swift as it is certain, and that it may be achieved with a smaller cost in human life and suffering as possible. Then may the true reward of their courage be granted, a just and lasting peace. By the 28th February, Bush announced a ceasefire, leaving Kuwait liberated. On the 3rd March 1991, Iraq agreed to all UN resolutions, and an agreement was finally signed on the 6th of April 1991. Thank you very much for what you've done over the last, uh, over the last few months. It's been an absolutely fabulous job. I don't think it could have been better done. And the general impression back home, and I think it's the right impression, is that this has been one of the most remarkable military episodes ever. It's been a copybook exercise. It was brilliantly planned. It was brilliantly done. And I'd just like you to know how very proud everyone is of the way that performed and the way you operated over the period of the last few months. We won't keep you out here a day longer than we have to. The sooner we can get you back home, we'll do so. I can't tell you precisely when that will be, but I do give you my word there'll be no undue delay about it. From one forward camp merging with the desert to another, and to the soldiers in each, he brought the same message. Thank you for your magnificent effort. We'll get you home as soon as possible, and you'll go on leave when you get there. In return, the desert rats presented the prime minister with a memento, a helmet, and a Chinese-made Kalashnikov. Thank you very much indeed. This will give me cabinet authority of a sort. <laughs> Just wait till we discuss public expenditure next year. <laughs> His final visit was to HMS Brave, where he brought to the sailors the same news and message he'd given to the land forces. Absolutely fabulous. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank but the importance of this visit to Kuwaitis and British forces lies in Mr. Major being the first senior statesman to come here since the war. Desmond Hamill, News at 10 with the Prime Minister in the Gulf. <laughs> the Queen welcomed home British troops returning from the first Gulf War. Thousands watched as 1,000 servicemen and women paraded through London. Reserved in its celebrations than in the U.S., a quiet triumph filled the city. A shared hope and genuine sense of pride pervaded the country. Another defining factor for Major was the Northern Ireland peace process. Major took his premiership in the midst of the troubles with Northern Ireland. 
The tension had been rising for decades, and he was given a distinct and clear reminder of the work that was needed to unite the nations. On the 7th February 1991, the IRA launched three homemade mortar shells at 10 Downing Street in an attempt to assassinate Prime Minister John Major. This was a well-planned attack aimed at the center of government. On fire in Whitehall, the van used to launch mortars at 10 Downing Street while the war cabinet was in session. An ITN camera was recording outside the front door when the blast rocked the building. Over the top of the building, a plume of smoke from the blast. One mortar landed in the garden of number 10 and exploded, blowing a deep crater in the lawn and smashing dozens of windows. The other two failed to go off. Two men were seen running away from the van, which appears to have been stopped on a precise spot to launch the bombs. There's no doubt this attack had been well planned. The mortars aimed at a precise angle through a hole cut in the roof. Finding that spot would have taken weeks of surveillance. One bus driver saw the missiles actually being launched. It just went into the air. I mean, first we heard the bang, then the missile came through the roof of the transit van, which uh, didn't go very high. I saw myself, didn't go very high. Then within five seconds, another bang came out, uh, came, and the missile came out, and the, then the van went into a flame. ITN staff working only a few yards from the back of number 10 ran for their lives as the mortars rained down. We were sitting in our outside broadcast vehicle um, behind Downing Street and uh, all of a sudden we heard a loud explosion to the right of us, a matter of a few feet away. Uh, the whole vehicle shook, we lost power, lots of smoke in the vicinity and then we ran for it. Police immediately moved in to clear an area stretching up to a mile in each direction. Nobody knew whether there were more bombs or booby trap devices Move inside the, the area. Now. Go back up the street. It is not safe. Move. In fact, one woman and two policemen had been hurt by flying glass. The Prime Minister and his war cabinet had been protected by strengthened windows. As news of the attack spread, there was a deep sense of shock that the provisional IRA had managed to strike so accurately at a time of such high security. Police had been convinced for some time that an IRA cell was still in this country. First priority now will be to examine the van and the missiles to see whether they provide any clues as to who the attackers were. The IRA had been planning this attack against former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, but after her sudden resignation, they decided to target her successor. The mortar shells exploded in the garden of number 10 in an attempt to destroy the cabinet office. Due to the bomb-resistant windows, none of the cabinet were hurt, though four people received minor injuries, two of which were police officers. This was a real wake-up call for the prime minister. He knew helping to build a peaceful relationship with Northern Ireland would be an important part of his premiership. A new draft of the Anglo-Irish Declaration was proposed in 1993, eventually becoming the Downing Street Declaration, one of the first significant steps on the road to the Good Friday Agreement years later. It contained the principle of consent, the foundation on which the peace process was built essentially stating the constitutional future of Northern Ireland would be decided by its own people. Unfortunately, in 1996, the IRA planted a bomb which exploded in Docklands. The event marked the end of a 17-month ceasefire. Two were killed and many more injured. It was a horrific event that prompted further discussions on the peace process. Major gave a ministerial broadcast, addressing the nation on the bombing and the breakdown of the IRA's ceasefire. More needed to be done to unite the nations in peace. After five months of peace, surely it is time to look ahead. Judge our proposals as a whole. There is nothing you need fear. Although Major was not Prime Minister when the Good Friday Agreement was signed a few years later by Prime Minister Tony Blair, 
it cannot be understated the work and influence Major had on realizing the agreement. It remains one of the great successes of his premiership, highlighting his extraordinary patience and skill in negotiating. The Queen's cousin, Lord Louis Mountbatten, was killed by the IRA in 1979, but later, in 2011, she would display the importance of peace and diplomacy as she shook hands with the former IRA leader. Discussions between Her Majesty and the Prime Minister during these years must have focused on the need for resolution. In April 1992, Major called for an election, which he won unexpectedly, with a majority of 336 seats, the fourth conservative election win in a row. It was an extraordinary win, as he remains the only prime minister to have gained more than 14 million votes in a general election. After 16 months on an uncertain lease, Mr. Major is already a different man. Downing Street is now, he says, home. Thank you very much indeed. I've only got one thing to say. It's nice to be back. <laughs> the boost to his confidence was obvious as he strode into Downing Street, a street which is normally closed to the general public, but which today was opened up to let supporters and well-wishers come and say hello. Someone called for three cheers. <laughs> To John Major, the fact that he's now been chosen by the people, albeit a minority of the electorate, rather than by the secret committee room votes of his fellow MPs, is important. I can now, uh, I can now accept that the country have elected me in my own right to be Prime Minister. Uh, I'm immensely proud of that. I shall try and ensure that I uh, reach the uh, aspirations of people and that I let no one down. That is, I'm delighted to have it. Thank you. And the change in the man was clear as he enjoyed his moment of glory first alone and then with Chris Patton. Strong personal support for the man who helped Mr. Major to victory and lost his own seat in the process. Later some very small boys with a bit of help from the Metropolitan Police came to deliver some presents and there was the Prime Minister again. No photo opportunity missed today. The contrast with Neil Kinnock's return to his home could not have been greater. The word is that he and his wife Glenys feel that they've taken enough punishment and that only massive pressure from the party for him to stay on will prevent him from calling it a day as leader. As to his future today, long and wonderful were the only words he had to describe it. Long and wonderful. Unfortunately, 1992 would not turn out to be a good year for monarch nor prime minister. Hello, utter turmoil in the money markets. That's what dominates the news today. For the first time ever, the government has put up interest rates twice in one day. The new rate is 15%, the weapon with which the government will take on the currency dealers. For investors, it's good news. Mortgage holders will scarcely dare breathe. The big building societies have said they will try to hold off putting up rates until after the French vote on Sunday. The first rise of 2% came mid-morning, but that didn't stop pressure on the pound. So three hours later, another 3% rise to 15% to take effect from tomorrow. September 1992, the pound sterling crashed. Britain was forced to withdraw from the European exchange rate mechanism, the ERM, because it could not prevent the value of the pound from falling below the specified lower limit. The ERM was created in the 1970s to help put European currencies on a level playing field in preparation for the economic and monetary union and the introduction of the euro. If a country was looking to replace their currency with the euro, they must keep the value within the specific range for several years. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. Massive speculative flows have continued to disrupt the functioning of the exchange rate mechanism. As chairman of the Council of European Finance Ministers, I have called a meeting of the Monetary Committee in Brussels urgently tonight 
to consider how stability can be restored to the foreign exchange markets. In the meantime, the government has concluded that Britain's best interests are served by suspending our membership of the exchange rate mechanism. Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, invested heavily, trying to keep it in the European exchange rate mechanism, raising interest rates first to 12% and then to 15%. But it didn't work. Major and Lamont admitted defeat. Britain was suspended from its membership of the ERM. At extreme cost, the Prime Minister faced great political damage, even more so because he had recently won re-election on a pro-Euro platform. A building in chaos for a policy in ruins. John Major arrived in Downing Street three hours ago, still with the builders there. The policy he conceived as Chancellor and carried out as Prime Minister in tatters. But it's the present Chancellor, Norman Lamont, who may be feeling the political heat most this morning. Yesterday you backed Norman Lamont for what you called his speed and courage. Shouldn't you know now, though, have a fresh start with a fresh Chancellor? No, I shouldn't. And I'll tell you why not. Norman Lamont uh, was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but the policy that Norman Lamont followed was my policy, the Cabinet's policy, all the Cabinet's policy, the policy we contested a general election on, the policy we won a general election on. Norman Lamont has followed that policy. He was overwhelmed by events, and I do not believe, because he was overwhelmed by events, doing what he promised he would do, seeking what he promised he would seek, Upon that basis, you cannot ask a man to leave a job he's been honorably doing and doing well. However, prosperity followed this event in the 1990s, improved economic growth, lower unemployment, and lower inflation. It must also be said, though Black Wednesday was seen as a real failure at the time, it did keep the UK out of the Eurozone, saving it from far more serious problems later on. On reflection of the political disaster that was Black Wednesday, Major considered resigning, but was convinced by his sister to stay on. Nonetheless, opinion polls of Major took a turn for the worse. General government approval and a sense of economic optimism took a sudden fall. Determined to try and unite his party and silence his critics, aides billed this as a speech from the heart. John Major reverted to his man of the people approach, which worked for him at the last election. Let me just pass this message to everyone who wishes the Conservative Party well. No diversions, no squabbles. Let's get on with that job of passing back that message, and then we will have the self-confident, expanding country that we all want to see. Constantly referring to his long-term aims, he also warned that have to be cuts in public spending. We are not prepared to see an ever-increasing tax burden, and nor are we prepared to mortgage our future by unrestrained borrowing. So we have to ensure that expenditure is properly disciplined. At present, and while he insisted he was committed to public services like health, he said the education system was betraying some children. One in four of our children leave secondary education and can't read properly, can't write properly, and are not competent in arithmetic. And what are they going to do? They can't all be prime minister. <laughs> 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> in the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. For the Queen, the year would later be known as her annus horribilis. It was the year in which the rocky marriage between Charles and Diana became public knowledge with the release of the infamous Andrew Morton book. It was also the year Andrew and Fergie would separate, Anne and Mark would divorce, and her beloved Windsor Castle would set on fire. There can be no doubt, of course, that criticism is good for people and institutions that are part of public life. 
new institution, city, monarchy, whatever, should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support, not to mention those who don't. But we are all part of the same fabric of our national society. And that scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humor, and understanding. As a year came to an end, the responsibility fell to Her Majesty's Prime Minister, John Major, to announce Charles and Diana's decision to separate. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. In a year that faced turmoil for both Prime Minister and Queen, those private and confidential conversations must have been very valuable to each of them. For both monarch and prime minister, the decade was not an easy one. In fact, it is well known to be one of the Queen's most difficult decades. But the special relationship between the constitutional monarch and prime minister was one valued to a great extent by both parties. As ever, the prime minister's audience with the monarch is kept absolutely confidential. They meet once a week, every week, and there is no record kept of anything said during these meetings. It is just the Queen and the Prime Minister, with no witnesses, no recordings or minutes taken. Major has often spoke about these audiences with the Queen, referencing how he and Prime Ministers before and after him considered them to be cathartic experiences. I mean, in those meetings, one small anecdote was that more often than not, you did have a gallery audience, but the gallery audience was the corgis. And they would sit there and, and mostly they were well behaved, but not invariably. And from time to time, the speak, queen would speak very sharply to one of the corgis, all of which she knew by name. If the corgi came round and was sort of indicating an interest in jumping up on your lap or deciding to make a meal of your toe. Uh, the Queen would uh, gently uh, discipline the dog and it would be moved away. So one, one saw that, as, as you might in any home in the country. The Queen, beyond doubt, is the best known woman in the world. Probably the most loved woman in the world, I, I would think as well. And then suddenly behind that enormous an enormous facade that exists because of her position. You see the private woman who lurks behind it. And that's rather a lovely thing to see. Major was the first of Her Majesty's Prime Ministers to be younger than the Queen. No doubt her experience and extensive knowledge of the governments that preceded Majors would have been of great value to him. Indeed, when it came to issues with foreign affairs, Major would merely mention the name of a state official or foreign leader, and the Queen would respond immediately with helpful hints and suggestions, often knowing them personally or their parents and families. Well, any Prime Minister who didn't listen to the Queen's views uh, was a very foolish man or woman indeed, uh, because she had an historic memory longer than any civil service advisor. And she had a great understanding of how people lived and was very interesting, interested in what government policy meant for the lives of people in different parts of the country. That was something about which she was concerned and about which she would ask questions. So you got a very clear idea from an intelligent, well-informed person about how some of the policies might be received and what their implications might be. And that to politicians who can often be locked in the narrow world of Westminster is easy. It's very easy to find yourself blocked off from opinion that once you would have been familiar with. And the Queen was one outlet where sometimes something was said that brought you back to realize exactly what something may mean. And I don't think there is a single prime minister who has worked with her who wouldn't say the same thing. 
It is reported that when Major took on the role of Prime Minister, it was a relief to the Queen. He was said to be close to the royal family, and he and the Queen benefited from an easy and relaxed relationship. Major's close relationship with the royal family was evidenced later on, when he was no longer Prime Minister. He became a special guardian to William and Harry after the death of their mother, Diana, Princess of Wales. Major went on to be the only politician invited to Prince Harry's wedding, a symbol of the close and trusting friendship that remained. After Her Majesty's death in September 2022, John Major was quick to comment on the lifelong service of an impeccable monarch. It is clear that John Major had a profound respect and admiration for the Queen. Well, I was immensely saddened when I heard it. It's, it's news nobody wished to hear. The Queen has been such a permanence in our lives for so long. You simply expected her to go on forever. And it's a great shock that suddenly she has gone. It's like a great oak has fallen. And it will be a day that people will remember in history for a very long time. And the great gifts the Queen has had is not only has she been the monarch, the symbol of royalty, but because of the manner in which she has lived, because of her empathy, she is almost as though she's a supernumerary member of every family in the country. So I think her loss will be personally felt by people. Not just felt, oh, it is sad that we have lost a great figure, but I think there will be personal degrees of sadness and a great many tears will be shed over the next few days. So, after calling in the lobby correspondents to the Downing Street Garden for half past four, with the word growing that this was something big, Mr Major, on the stroke of five o'clock, began to explain his decision. I've now been Prime Minister for nearly five years. In that time, we've achieved a great deal. But for the last three years, I've been opposed by a small minority in our party. During those three years, there have been repeated threats of a leadership election. In each year, they turned out to be phony threats. Now the same thing again is happening in 1995. I believe it's in no one's interest that this continues right through until November. It undermines the government and it damages the Conservative Party. I am not prepared to see the party I care for laid out on the rack like this for any longer. With Scottish Secretary Ian Lang and Transport Secretary Brian McWinney already on the campaign team watching him, Mr Major talked of the forthcoming election. If I win, I shall continue as Prime Minister and lead the party into and through the next general election. Should I be defeated, which I do not expect, I shall resign as Prime Minister and offer my successor my full support. There were great divides in the party over the issues with Europe. Questions were also being raised as to whether Major could unite the party and continue to lead effectively. Majors was challenged for leadership only by John Redwood MP, which came as a surprise to many. Norman Lamont became a significant member of Redwood's team. Redwood represented the Eurosceptic side of the party, garnering a fair amount of support. However, Major was victorious, securing 218 votes with 66%. In his cabinet reshuffle, Redwood was not reappointed to cabinet. Though Major won the leadership, the Conservative majority was rapidly falling. By 1997, the Conservatives were without a majority in the House of Commons. Major's government was totally divided and riddled by allegations of sleaze exacerbated by the press. Major waited as long as possible before calling a general election, which would finally happen on 1st May 1997. The next election will offer us the chance to change our country, not just to promise change, but to achieve it. The historic goal of another Labour government, our party, New Labour, our mission, New Britain, New Labour, New Britain. In the lead up to the election, on a live Channel 4 interview, Blair draws his lines in the sand with his definition of New Labour, 
and a radical and reformed Labour Party. What, what does your concept of radical really involve? It involves recognizing that the basic principles of the Labour Party, which are about justice and progress, that's what the Labour Party should be about, that those principles should be applied in a different way to today's world. Back in 1945, when Clem Attlee and his government came in, they were a radical government in the sense that the way they thought to do it was to build up the state, nationalization, and so on. That's not the way for today's world. The way for today's world is education, skills, technology, developing small businesses, encouraging design and invention in Britain. It's a different role for government. It's a different relationship with industry. And it's a different attitude to the things that really matter. Tony Blair later claims to have been most surprised when, on 1st May 1997, he was elected Britain's youngest prime minister since 1812, ending 18 years of conservative rule with a majority of 179. He's coming out now and will address the nation through those microphones. Good morning. I said most of what I wish to say when I had the opportunity of speaking last evening. But perhaps there are just one or two things that it would be appropriate to add this morning. It has been an immense privilege to serve as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom over the last six and a half years. It's a privilege that comes to very few people, and it's a very precious privilege indeed. I hope as I leave Downing Street this morning that I can say with some accuracy that the country is in far better shape than it was when I entered Downing Street. The economy is booming, interest rates low, inflation low, unemployment falling, the growth pattern is well set, the health service is expanding, the education service is improving, and the crime statistics are falling. All of those, I think, are benevolent improvements in the interests of all the people of this country. I hope if you will forgive me, I will say no more this morning. I believe, as you know, I have an appointment with Her Majesty the Queen in a few moments to tender my resignation so that the new government may then be formally appointed. I propose to see Her Majesty in just a few moments. The second reason I'll say no more now is that after that I hope uh, that Norma and I will be able with the children to get to uh, the Oval in time for lunch and for some cricket this afternoon. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. One can only imagine the conversation at the final meeting when John Major went to Buckingham Palace to offer his resignation to the Queen. It is almost inevitable that they will have had differing views on a number of issues over his nearly seven years in office. But it is widely acknowledged that they had enormous respect for each other in their roles, coupled with a good degree of personal affection and regard. After seven years in office and so many audiences with the Queen, this was to be the last. Mr. Major tendering his resignation as Prime Minister, the final formal termination of 18 years of Conservative government. John Major with his fellow survivors about to experience for the first time life in opposition. Tony Blair, meanwhile, was still at his North London home, basking in the glow of his astonishing political triumph and the applause of supporters camped out in the street. Soon his life would change forever with a wave to the children he was off, but not for long. Within seconds, he'd stop the car for a walkabout to the obvious surprise of the security team now guarding him. After Major left office in April 2005, the Queen honored him with a companion of the Order of the Garter, personal gift from the Queen limited to only 24 people at one time, a display of her deep gratitude for his service. It's a night perhaps to look back, I hope with some pride, at the changes that we have made to our country in the last 18 years. At the time of his premiership, John Major was not known to be a particularly successful prime minister, nor a natural leader, as he faced heavy criticism. But that may not be an entirely fair assessment. Major's premiership will surely be looked on more kindly in the history books. Entering his premiership after such a formidable leader as Margaret Thatcher, 
He had a tremendous legacy to live up to. But by the time he handed over the reins to labor leader Tony Blair, the country's economy was growing for the first time in many years. I first entered Parliament 18 years ago, tomorrow, I think. <laughs> and the difference in our country is a difference you could not express unless you remembered what it was like in May of 1979 when the Conservatives first came to government. Many people who voted in this general election perhaps never knew that, for they have never known anything in their adult lives but Conservative government, and others perhaps have not remembered precisely what it was like. Well, I said a moment ago that this party had served longer in government than any other. We've suffered great defeats before. We have always come back. Although it had not been an easy decade for the Prime Minister, Major managed to leave the country in a better state than how he had found it. Surely this is the hope and ambition of every Prime Minister of Her Majesty's government. He is a Prime Minister that will be remembered for his mild-mannered style and sincere charm. Major was an honorable and decent Prime Minister who served Britain with a simple intention of making it great once more. To the Queen, it is obvious their relationship was one of trust, of support, and of admiration. For Her Majesty the Queen, Sir John Major will always be her ninth Prime Minister.